This sermon is titled How to Receive What God Has Provided, Part 1. Be enriched as you listen. We're going to take some time to study the Word of God over these next three Sundays on, on this topic. We are titled, uh, we're titling this series, How to Receive What God Has Provided. How to Receive What God Has Provided provided. And uh, I feel this is very important uh, for us. To some of us, this may be a reminder of things we have learned in the past. For some of us, these things may be new. But I want you to pay attention to the, to the time we spend in the Word of God over these three Sundays. How to receive what God has provided. Now, think about this with me. You know, suppose I had a good friend, and uh, I saw that, uh, you know, he needed a jacket. Maybe a jacket that would keep him warm, or maybe a jacket that would make him look nice or something. And I saw that he had a need. He needed a jacket. And so I went to the store. I bought him the right jacket, the one that will keep him really warm, the one that's really, uh, that his, is his size. And that, that's just looking good for him. I went, paid for it, got it packaged in a nice gift box. And I brought it and I provided it from him or, or gave it to him as a gift. There's only one thing that's left. He needs to receive it. It's been fully paid for. It's been offered to him freely as a gift. And there's only one thing left. He needs to receive it. Now, sometimes he may not know that I'm offering that as a gift to him. Maybe he's looking somewhere else or he just doesn't know that I'm offering that as a gift to him. And so that lack of knowing that this thing is being offered to him as a gift may keep him from receiving it. Sometimes he may feel like he needs to fast and pray in order to receive it. Actually, that's not necessary at all because it's, being, it's been fully paid for and it's being offered to him as a gift. But instead of just receiving it, he feels like he needs to do something. So he, you know, I got to fast and pray. I got to do this. I got to do that. And, 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 and in that whole process, he actually misses out on receiving something that's being offered to him freely as a gift. And you know, so many of us Christians, believers, are just like that. Because the Bible, and, and we're going to look at scripture on this. The Bible tells us, teaches us, that God has already made full provision. God has already made full provision for many of the things that we actually need. He's already made the provision. And we, we say it like this, Jesus paid it all. We believe in the cross of Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus died on the cross. And we sing even hymns that tell us Jesus paid it all. What did he pay for? For all, for everything. Everything that we ever need. Now, we, we can itemize these things, and it will just become a long list if we try to itemize all the things that Jesus paid for. Let's look at just one scripture uh, that we are all familiar with in Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Of, uh, it's that chapter where Isaiah uh, spoke about the cross of Jesus. And we just look at one verse, Isaiah 53, verse 5. And it tells us there that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. Jesus paid for everything. He paid for our sins, our transgressions. He paid for our iniquities so that we could be forgiven. And this verse says the Punishment for our peace. That in, the word in English, peace, is the Hebrew word shalom, which simply means total well-being, uh, total wholeness. The punishment he bore brought us total wholeness, and by his stripes 
the price he paid, we are healed. So there is forgiveness. He paid for it. There is wholeness. He paid for it. There is healing. He paid for it. And then we could go on and list many other things. Salvation, he paid for it. Redemption is already paid for. Uh, freedom from sin is already paid for. Answered prayer is already paid for. Authority and dominion over Satan, it's already provided through the work of Christ on the cross. Um, uh, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, already paid for, already provided through the cross. Galatians 3.14 says, the blessing of Abraham, already provided for through the cross. The, the righteousness of God, already provided for. In fact, we will see, the Bible says, all spiritual blessings have already been provided for. So, the important thing for us is to understand that the provision has been made. And I want this to sink into your heart. God has already provided for everything we need. So, you know, that we are not waiting on God to provide for us. We're not waiting on God to do the work of salvation or to provide salvation or forgiveness of sins or healing. We're not trying to uh, earn these provisions. Uh, we're not trying to convince God to provide. He's already done it. And look at Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. It's, uh, again, a very familiar uh, verse of Scripture, but I think uh, this is so powerful. Ephesians Chapter 1, verse 3, the Apostle Paul writes it. And I want you to look at the tense of the scripture. It says, Blessed be God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Now notice the past tense. He has blessed us. Meaning it's done. So, Imagine my friend coming to me and asking me, okay, could you please buy me a jacket? I would say, I already bought it for you. It's already there. But that's what many of us are doing. We're going and asking God to do something he has already done because the Bible says he has blessed us. He's already provided it. It's already given to you. So we're not here to go and Convince God to give it to us. And what has he provided? It says here, every spiritual blessing. Every means all. Every blessing that God could possibly give to you and me, he has already blessed us with. It's already provided, being provided for. Look at another scripture. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses Three and four, Second Peter, chapter one. I hope you're making notes, or at least you could go and download the sermon notes. These, uh, these, uh, these references are there. And in Second Peter, chapter one, verses three and four. Look at verse three. As His divine power has given to us. So again, it's past tense. He has given to us. If God has given to you, there's no need to go and ask Him to give. Because he has given to us. What? All things. Not some things. Not a few things. But all things that pertain to life and godliness. So Peter is saying, you know, God has already given to us everything we need for life and godliness. To live this life. Whatever you need to live this life. And to live in godliness, to live in holiness, God has already given that to us. And how has he given it to us? It says here in verse 3, through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. By the very fact that you know him, by the very fact that we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and have embraced him, but through the knowledge of him, through knowing Jesus, this has become available to us. God has given to us all things. That pertain to life. To live this life on earth. What do you need? God's already given it to you. It's already been provided for you. All things that pertain to life. 
and godliness. Just by us knowing him who called us to glory and virtue. And then he tells us in verse 4, he has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises so that by these we could be partakers of the divine nature. So, you know, through those promises, what has happened? We are actually sharing in God's divine nature and we escape the corruption, the moral decay that is in the world. Um, just to emphasize this, you know, when we go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, uh, Peter is writing, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, the apostle Peter. He's been with Jesus, you know, in his ministry, and, and here he's writing 1 Peter 2, 24, and look at the tense of this verse. It says, who, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we having died to sins, so past tense, we are dead to sins, might live for righteousness. So I died to sin. It's a done thing. So now I live for righteousness. That's what we are in. Then he continues, by whose stripes you were healed. You know, we read Isaiah 53, 5. Isaiah speaking, saying, by whose stripes you are healed. Peter says, by the Holy Spirit, by whose stripes you were healed. Now, I want to focus on the last part of that verse, by whose stripes you were healed. Some people say, you know, they read this verse and they think that healing has to do with only forgiveness of sins as they spiritualize it. But you know, if you look, if you're a student of the Bible, what would you do? You go look at the Greek. That word, the Greek word healed is used 28 times in the New Testament. 28 times. Out of the 28 times, 23 times used in the Gospels, uh, used in the New Testament, specifically for physical healing and deliverance from demonic powers. So 23 out of the 28. The remaining five are actually quotations from the book of Isaiah, where, you know, Jesus says, I'm, he I'm healing the brokenhearted. So in those five references, it can in include inner healing. So making you whole on the inside. But it all has to do with healing. 23 times physical healing. Five times we can say, quotation on the Old Testament from Isaiah. Okay, it has to do with inner healing. So we can't take 1 Peter 2.24 and say that only has to do with spiritual healing. No, he's talking about physical healing. And what does he say about physical healing? 1 Peter 2.24. By whose stripes you were healed. So as far as God is concerned, he's saying, look, I've provided it for you. It's done. He's given you healing. And every blessing of the cross has already been provided. And I want us to understand that. Today, whatever you need, whether it's healing in your body, healing in your mind, a blessing in your life. Maybe you need to live victory, gain victory over some besetting sin that is holding you down. Maybe you've been in bondage for 25 years to that sin. And you are thinking, I'm waiting on God to break my chain. I want you to know, he already broke your chain. It's done. He broke the chain on the cross. What's left for us to receive? That's what's left. So you're not waiting on God to break your chains to set you free from sin. He completed that work on the cross for you. Your chains have been broken. Your sickness has been healed. Provision has been made for shalom in your life and mind. It's done as far as God is concerned. He has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we are not waiting on God to do it for us. God is waiting on us to receive it. It's like me offering my friend that, that gift of the jacket. The only thing left is for him to receive. It's been paid for. I already paid for it at the store. I packaged it in a box called Grace. It's free. And I'm giving it to him. Only one thing that's left. He has to receive it. And that's so true for us as believers. God has provided. What is it that you need? God has provided it for you on the cross. He has blessed you with it. It's already yours. What you and I need to learn is how do we receive 
what God has provided. Now, I want us to say a few more, I want to say a few more things before we get into the how-to. The reason God provided it is so we, so we can have it. You see, many of us have a very wrong picture of God. And sometimes, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of preaching and teaching we've heard has distorted our understanding of God. We think of God as a very miserly, very stingy God. But actually, God is El Shaddai, a very bountiful God. He gives to all. And the reason he has made provision is for one reason, so that you can have it. The reason Jesus bore our sicknesses and diseases is so that we can be healed. It's not that God wants you to be sick. He's provided healing. And the reason he provided healing is so that we can be healed. The reason he provided shalom is so that we could have total well-being. So the reason provision has already been made is, for that, is so that you and I can actually have it and enjoy it here in this life. So you have already been qualified to enjoy your share of the inheritance. Colossians 1 and verse 12, the apostle Paul tells us that we are qualified to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints. That means, you know, there's nothing more you need to do to qualify to receive. It's a matter of receiving, learning how to receive. You're already qualified to receive. So that's what we want to do in this series. How do we receive what God has provided? Before we get into the how-to, I want to touch on two important things. One is this, and uh, I'm intentionally touching on these things because uh, many times uh, uh, these things throw us off as believers. First of, first of all, we must understand the difference between grace provisions and work rewards. You know, sometimes, and I, and, uh, you know, I want to say this very sensitively, because it is a very sensitive matter. Sometimes we see somebody, you know, maybe they've served God for 40 years, 50 years, and then they are struck by some illness. And you know how we pray? We pray saying, God he has been such a faithful minister of God, so he deserves to be healed. We are confusing grace provision with work rewards. We think he deserves to be healed, but healing is not a reward. Healing is a grace provision. You cannot earn what is given by grace. He has been a faithful servant of God for 40 years. He will get his reward in heaven when he stands before the judgment seat of Christ. And the Bible says, our works will be tested by fire of what sort it is, whether gold, silver, or precious stones, or wood, hay, or stubble. And then each man will receive a reward for his work. So he will receive his reward for his 40 years of faithful service, but healing is not a reward. Healing is is a provision of grace. And this is where many of us miss it. The way we pray, we're praying wrong. We say, oh God, he deserves to be healed. No, he doesn't deserve to be healed. He deserves a reward which he will get in heaven for his faithful service. But healing, everything that comes through the cross of Jesus, is a grace provision, meaning God has already provided it for us freely based on grace. Not based on our works. So understand the difference between grace provisions and work rewards. God will definitely reward us for our faithful uh, service in his kingdom. But we cannot barter with God. Try to get what he offers by grace based on our faithful service. Don't confuse the two. Salvation is a grace provision. Healing is a great provision. Meeting your financial needs is a grace provision. Uh, you know, uh, setting us free from sin is a grace provision. Everything that comes to the cross is provided by God based on grace. So that's one thing we need to understand. The second thing we need to understand is faith and responsibility. That means from the time God put... Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, he gave them responsibility. For, the, for instance, he told them to tend the garden. 
and take care of it. That was their responsibility. So there is responsibility placed on us, and we cannot use faith to fulfill our responsibility. No, you can't do that. Responsibility has to be fulfilled. And then you exercise faith over and above fulfilling that responsibility. Example, if I want God to meet my needs, financial needs, example, what is my responsibility? I've got to work. So if I don't do my work, I can't just sit at home and say I have faith to meet my need. No, I've got to do my work. Whatever work, you know, all of us do different things. So, but I fulfill my responsibility. And then over and beyond that, I exercise faith in God to meet my need. But if I don't fulfill my responsibility, then I'm failing in that aspect. And faith is going to be short-circuited. You can't exercise faith because I'm not doing the very basic thing God has told me to do. You know, think, for example, the whole issue of divine protection. There is responsibility. You protect yourself. You say, Where did God tell us to protect ourselves? Many places. For instance, you know, when Jesus sent his disciples out in Matthew 10, 23, he said, if they persecute you in one city, flee to the other. Let me repeat that. What did he tell his disciples? Matthew 10, 23. When they persecute you in one city, flee to another. Meaning, protect yourself. Didn't Jesus know Psalm 91? He will give his angels charge over me. Shouldn't he have told his disciples when they persecute you, stand up there and recite Psalm 91? He didn't tell them to do that. He said, when they persecute you, flee. That means protect yourself. Do what you can to protect your life. Now, if you're in a position where you cannot flee, that's when you say, you use the word of God. So God, you know, there's no way I can flee now. So the only thing I've left is your word. You give your angels charge over me. You know, and this is a true incident I heard about a, a young couple. You know, they had a little child. Uh, they were around a swimming pool, and they just left the child to wander, you know, just go around. And the caretaker of the swimming pool came to, and told his parents, you know, hey, you need to watch over your child because, you know, if the child falls in the pool, the child might drown. You know what the parents said? No, 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 no. The angels of God are watching over our child. God has given angels charge over our child, and they will keep our child. The next day, the baby fell in the pool and drowned. Now, this is true story. He's not making it up. What was wrong? Responsibility. God didn't give angels responsibility to take care of the child. The parents responsibility to take care of the child. Now, the parents do their part and then over and above extend faith. But here they didn't do the responsibility. Faith will not work. So understand this, that responsibility. God has made us responsible of the knowledge and the resources he is given to us. Today we are living in a world of advanced knowledge. Use that knowledge to protect yourself. Use that knowledge to your advantage. We have more knowledge today than people in Bible times. That was 2,000 years ago or more. And so what must we do? Our responsibility is to use the knowledge and the resources, and then over and above that, exercise faith. So faith and responsibility, we need to understand how this works. So having said all that, the main purpose of this series is to help us understand how to receive what God has provided. How do we receive what God has provided? And for this, I want us to look at the life of Abraham. So we're going to go to the fourth chapter of the book of Romans, Paul's uh, epistle to Uh, the Romans, because in chapter 4 of Romans, uh, Paul, uh, by the Holy Spirit, points to Abraham as a father of faith. The word father means the forerunner, the pioneer, uh, you know, the the prototype of faith. And you read uh, read this in verses 11 and 12. So Romans chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. I want to read this. Please follow with me in your Bibles. It's talking about Abraham. He says, and he... Abraham received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the faith which he had while still uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all those who believe, though they are uncircumcised, that righteousness might be imputed to them also. And the father of circumcision to those not only uh, those 
who not only are of the circumcision, but also walk in the steps of the faith which our father Abraham had while still uncircumcised. So verses 11 and 12 basically say that Abraham is the father of both the circumcised and the uncircumcised. That is, the Jew and the Gentile. He is the father of what? Of faith. That whether you're a Jew or whether you're a Gentile, when you have faith, what God wants us is to walk in the same kind of faith as Abraham. And Abraham has been set up for us as a prototype, as example, as a forerunner of what it means to walk with faith in God. That's essentially verses 11 and 12. Whether you are Jew or Gentile, we are all walking in the steps of the faith of Abraham. Now, Abraham's life, uh, we understand, we know that God came and gave him a promise. He said, I'm going to make you the father of a, many na- of a big nation. And this was when Abraham and Sarah were well advanced in years. And uh, there was no chance of Abraham and Sarah ever having a son. Abraham was well advanced. They were both well advanced in years. And Sarah was barren from her youth up. So they never had children. And it was impossible for them to have a child. And yet, through their journey, the next 25 years, they journeyed and came to this place where they received the promise. They saw the fulfillment of the promise. And so God is pointing to Abraham as a father of faith. And in this fourth chapter, verses 17 to 21, the apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, outlines the steps of the faith of Abraham. And that's what we want to look at. I will bring our attention uh, to one, the first step today, and then over the next couple of Sundays, we will look at the other steps Abraham took. We're going to read verses 17 to 21. It, Romans 4, 17 to 21. We'll just look at the first step today that Abraham took before we close, and we will continue this next week. Romans 4, verses 17 to 21. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. In the presence of him whom he believed, God, who gives life to the dead and calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Verse 18, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations, according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Verse 19, and not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about a hundred years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what he had promised, he was also able to perform. So we're going to look at these Five verses very closely and outline the steps of faith that Abraham took to journey from that place where it was impossible for him, him and Sarah, to have a son, to becoming or receiving what God had provided or promised for his life. So we're going to look at that very carefully. The first thing we see is, is verse 17. The first step is pretty simple. What did Abraham do? It says, in the presence of him whom he believed, God. So first step, how did Abraham receive what God had promised? He believed God. He believed God. So the first thing for us to receive what God has already provided is to believe God. And we want to learn How to believe God. How do we believe God? So, Abraham believed God. So today, for us to receive what God has provided, we have to believe God. Believe God and His Word. Now, John 17, 17 says, Your Word is truth. So that means you and I can believe His Word. Believing his word is believing God. So believe his word. When his word says that he has provided healing, he has provided you victory over Satan and demonic powers, he has provided you victory over sin, whatever his word says, 
You believe his word. Believe his word. Now, what does it mean to believe his word? I want to just share a few things along those lines. Now, the definition, of the, uh, the, the word believe and the word faith in the New Testament come from the same root Greek word. It's the same word. Sometimes it's translated faith and sometimes it's translated belief. Faith, just the, what is the difference? Well, faith is a noun. The noun form of that word is translated faith. And the verb form of that same word is translated belief, but it's the same word, the same Greek word. The noun form is translated faith, have faith. The verb, the action part, is translated as belief, but it's the same word, so you could understand it interchangeably. So what does it mean to believe God? Hebrews 11.1 1 tells us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. So there's a difference between faith and hope. Hope is in the future. I, I, I'm desiring to have it. But faith is the substance. When you have faith, you have the substance of it. That word substance is in the Greek is very interesting. It, it, it means two things. That word, that same word means two things. It means the groundwork, the foundation, the support. Faith is the support. It, it is a, the foundation, the groundwork of things hoped for. But that word is also translated title deed or uh, the certificate of ownership. So faith is the substance, it's the title deed. It's the proof of ownership of things hoped for. So, to have faith is to say, I have it. It's the title deed of what you're hoping for. So, keep that thought in mind. That when you have a title deed, you're certain it's yours. For example, if you bought a car and you have the certificate that says... This car, registration number so-and-so, belongs to so-and-so. Belongs to you, your name. Uh, there's not going to be a moment of doubt that that car is not yours. Because you have the certificate of ownership. Now that's what faith is. It's that absolute certainty that it's yours. Faith is a proof of ownership. So when you have that proof of ownership in you, you have faith. You believe in God. Or, verse 11 says, it continues, it's the evidence, or that word evidence can be conviction or assurance, of things not seen. So here it's drawing... That this conviction is independent of your mind. See, many people get confused. They think faith is a mind thing. It's not a mind thing. Because it's talking about having a conviction, an assurance of what you can't see. That means your mind is not involved right now. Because you can't see it. It's not recognizable to your natural senses. But you've got a conviction inside you. You've got an assurance inside you. That's faith. Abraham believed, or he had faith. That means, in his spirit, he had a proof of ownership. He had a conviction in his heart. Could he see it? Couldn't see it. Could he feel it? Can't feel it. Can he smell it? No, I can't. Your senses cannot recognize it. It's not tangible to your senses yet, but something inside you says, I got it. I'm not going to get it. You know, somebody has a certificate for their car. You go and ask them, is that your car? 
Uh, no, 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 it's going to become mine. I'm, I'm going to have it three years from now. No, no, they wouldn't say that. It, it is mine. I have the certificate of ownership. It is mine now. So that's faith. It's that ownership, the proof of ownership inside you. I have it. It's the conviction in you, even when your natural senses are saying, it's not there. Abraham believed God. So, that's the first thing. We must believe God. In order to receive, we believe his word. Now, one more reference before we uh, go. We, we go to Mark chapter 11, verse 24. Mark chapter 11. We'll continue on these thoughts next week. Uh, but I just want to point a few things out here. Mark chapter 11. Uh, now we know this. Many of us are very familiar with these scriptures because we quote them often before our declaration, you know, just to, you know, Jesus cursed the fig tree, it dried up, and then he gave instructions to his disciples about, he says in verse 22, you know, have faith in God. Then verse 23, he says, uh, you know, whoever will say to the mountain, be removed, be cast into the sea, and doesn't doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, he will have whatever he says. And then in verse 24, he says, what things so Oh, whatever you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you will have them. So just to quickly summarize these three verses, Jesus have faith in God. So we're talking about having faith in God. Abraham believed God. Abraham had faith in God. How do you exercise that faith in God? In these two verses, Jesus is telling us you can exercise it in two ways. One is by saying and the other one is through praying. Verse 23, you say. Verse 24, you pray. But there is a parallel for both these actions. When you are saying, what must you do? Don't doubt in your heart, but believe in your heart. So when you pray, what do you do? Believe that you receive. Believe. So believing is in both places. Whether you're saying or you're praying, you've got to believe. And the word whatever is in both verses 23 and 24. That means it includes anything. Whether you're praying for healing, freedom from sin, victory over circumstances, finances, whatever. Whatever is covered in that having faith in God. So you say, don't doubt in your heart, but believe in your heart. So I want to emphasize that. That we believe with the heart. Like we saw in Hebrews 11. It's a conviction that sometimes our mind is not, cannot recognize. So believing is of the heart. You believe with your heart, with your spirit. You believe. Abraham believed God in his heart. Now, what must we believe? Verse 24. Believe that you receive and you will have. Let me repeat that again. I'm reading it from verse 24. Believe that you receive, and you will have. What must we believe? Believe that you receive. How do we receive what God has provided? Through believing. Believe that you receive. And we receive first in our spirit. In our spirit. That's where you have the proof of ownership. The proof or the title deed that you received it. So believe that you receive. Or you receive through believing. So what must I believe? That it's mine. So I believe that I receive my healing. And then Jesus says, and you will have. The having follows later. So this is where many of us miss it. We wait till we have it to believe it. 
But Jesus said, you believe that you receive. And then you will have. So let's stop there for today. What must I do to receive from God? First, I must believe God. But how do I believe God? Worship team, let's come together, please. But what must I believe? I must believe that I receive. That means, as we pray, say, God, I receive it. Where? In my spirit. By faith, it's mine, I take it. But I don't feel anything different. Well, faith is a conviction of things not seen. That means my senses can't recognize it yet. But I'm convinced about it. I believe it's mine. Because God said it. Because God said, by whose stripes you were healed. Because God said, sin will not have dominion over you. So you believe you're free from whatever besetting sin or habit that's enslaved you. You believe you're free from the, that spirit of fear because God said he has not given you a spirit of fear but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So you believe that you receive God, I receive. Now, to come to that place where we believe that we receive, that means it's done as far as my heart is concerned. I believe I received it. To come to that place may take us some time. And the most important thing that will help us come to that place is meditating in the Word of God. You got to go to that particular scripture or those scriptures, the Word that is, ad that is addressing your problem and meditate on that. If it's healing, it's a provision of grace. God has already provided it for you. Now it's a matter of you and I receiving it and we are learning how to receive we talked about the first step, which is believing that you receive. But how do I come to that place where I have that proof of ownership? I, I have the title lead in my spirit. I know it's mine. How do I come to that place of faith? How do I come to that place of being convinced that I received it? I gotta look at the word. Say, God, because you said it, I receive it. Your word is truth. So it's not going to come by listening to somebody's prophecy. You see, that's a big concern. We go around listening to people's prophecies and this and that. And I mean, it's okay. But you need to know what the Bible says. What did God say in the word about your problem, about your situation? Take time on that word. And come to that place by just meditating, saying, God, I believe your word is truth. And in your heart, you settle the matter. That means it's done. As far as you're concerned, you believe that you receive. And you know you will have it. That's, not, that's God's part. Don't worry about it. The part you and I have to do is to believe that we receive. And Abraham believed God. So today, I know we've just got started, but I want to remind you, everything Jesus did on the cross, God has provided it to you freely by grace. You can't do anything to earn it. The only thing we can do is receive. And the first step, is to believe that you receive. Believe that you receive. And say, God, I believe it's mine. In your heart, because you believe with your heart. You may not feel it in your body, but you believe in your heart it is yours. Because God said it's yours, and God is not going to lie. If I told my friend, friend, you know, I went to the store, I bought this jacket for you, 
it's yours. He believes it. He takes my word for it. And then he reaches and takes it. He believes my word. He takes my word. So that's the thing. First step. You take God's word. You believe his word. So right where you are. Will you believe God's word? He said he has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. It's yours. He's not going to lie. He said. He's given, he has given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness. See, the devil may lie to you and say you can never live a godly life. You're going to be in bondage. You're going to be in sin. That's a lie. God's word says he's given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. All things. He has given to us. I don't know what your personal need is, and I'm sure that there are these a variety of various needs, numerous needs. But today, as we worship, as we pray, you can look to God with confidence and say, God, I thank you. What I need has already been provided. It's already been granted. It's already been given to me. And I want to encourage you to find the Word of God, Scriptures, that speak to your knee. But God says, look, I've, I've given it to you. If it's healing, you take scriptures like 1 Peter 2.24 or Isaiah 3.5 and say, God, I thank you. My healing has been given to me. It's mine. You may have an incurable disease. Doctors may have said nothing can be done. But the great physician, Jehovah Rapha, has said one thing. He said, by the stripes of Jesus, you were healed. By his stripes, you were healed. He said, you were healed. Now, you receive. Believe that you receive. Say, God, it's mine. The worship team is going to lead us in a few moments. I want you to make this a moment of you looking to God and saying, God, I thank you that you have made provision. And then after that, I'm going to come back and just pray a simple prayer. I'm going to come into agreement with you. I just believe that you're safe, whatever it is. Let's worship God for a few moments, please. You are great. You to me. So great, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you, for you are great. You the miracle, so great, there is no one else like you. There is 
come, let's lift it up. Sing, for you are you the miracle so great. It's Jesus, there is no one else like you. There is no one else like you. Amen. Amen. Right where you are, I want to encourage you. Believe God. Believe His Word. His Word is truth. Every promise in this book is true. All his promises are yes and amen. Jesus Christ has made that provision. It's already been provided. Now we must learn how to receive. The first step is to believe God, believe his word. Whatever your need is, some may be there in financial situ situations of financial need. Some may be there, you know, wanting God to work in their home, their family, their marriage, the children. Uh, there may be needs, physical needs, healing, emotional needs. And there may be people who are struggling with bondage to sin and Everything's been provided. And you and I must believe the word of God. This morning, would you believe? And say, Lord, I thank you. My freedom has been provided for. It's provided for on the cross. To the cross of Jesus Christ. My healing has been provided for. Shalom in my life has been provided for. And I believe that I receive. I believe that I receive. It's mine. Because your word says, it's mine. Let's pray. Father, pray for those who are listening to us, watching. We believe your word. Your word is truth, Father. What you said that you provided, we believe it's ours. It's for us. And we believe we that we receive because you've given it to us. So in the name of Jesus, for those who need physical healing in their bodies, who need healing in their minds, we believe we receive. We believe we receive your provision. We believe we receive your touch on our families, our homes, the lives of our children. We believe we receive freedom that you provided for from sin and bondage and things that easily beset us. We receive the freedom that's been provided. It's ours. It's ours. We receive it. We thank you, Lord. And Father, confirm your word in the lives of your people. Confirm your word in the lives of your people. Let people rise up healed, delivered. Let them see things change in their lives because we believe we receive. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as we continue, you are going to see, you are going to experience the miracles of God taking place. I want you to share your testimony. Send your testimony. We believe God's word will not return to him wide. God will fulfill his word in your life. And we want to hear those testimonies and and we'll collect them and share them as well here so that we could all be encouraged knowing that God is fulfilling His Word. We're going to close today. We want to thank you once again for being with us on the service. Feel free to share this with other people so that they could be built up. 
they could be encouraged. Remember to connect back next Sunday as we continue in this series on how to receive what God has provided. Let's close. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit continue with each of us always. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a great week. I'll see you again. Thanks. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, publication, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcbiblecollege.org. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play Store.